Thank you for choosing Access On Demand. Access believes in continuing education, and we create content to empower you to learn and grow anytime, anywhere. Let's get started. Hi there, my name is Arlene Maxim. I'm a registered nurse and senior vice president of clinical services at Access. Today we are going to do an Oasis E training. We're going to talk about the anatomy of Oasis E. This is not intended to be an entire training of Oasis E because you can't get that 45 minutes, but uh, we are going to go over some conventions and we're going to go over some areas of OASIS itself that many of you may not have been thinking about in the past and with OASIS E going in with that to value-based purchasing um, on the very same day, January 1st, uh, we have to be aware of some things that perhaps in the past we kind of glossed over and didn't pay a lot of attention to. So the training objectives for today was will be that we're going to introduce you to OASIS and OASIS E in general. Um, we're going to go over the background of OASIS, I'll let you know where we've been and perhaps maybe where we're going. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of a technology update as far as OASIS Crosswalk is concerned. We have some um, free information for you that will be available on our website and um, talk a little bit about the Impact Act and where OASIS actually got started and the reason for OASIS-E behind the Impact Act. And then uh, talk a little bit about the OASIS training manual that they gave us um, from CMS. It's pretty incredible. It's uh, probably the most comprehensive training manual they've ever given to us um, as an industry. So it's um, a pretty exciting. Um, as I was going through it, I thought, gosh, how organized this is and how much easier it's going to be to train uh, clinicians on Oasis E in general. So um, let's get started and talk about home health all by itself. Um, many times we as clinicians um, are the only people some of these bedridden patients ever see in the home. So it involves unique challenges to us, for us. Um, and, uh, but working in home health care gives us the, the opportunity to improve the quality of care of the patient. And that's exactly what we're getting at. So with OASIS E, we're going to have a requirement to show improved outcomes and um, that's part of the impetus behind Oasis E and certainly with value-based purchasing. And as we show those improved outcomes on the patient, um, we're going to get increased satisfaction, increased joy in our jobs, and the patient certainly is going to be much more satisfied. So prior to the year 2000, some of you probably may remember this, uh, we had no OASIS. We had we were able to do assessments on just about anything we wanted to do it on. Um, and so and we all kind of made up our own. There were some publication companies that put some documents out, but typically we um, organize our own assessment tools. Um, but by the year 2000, we went through the Balanced Budget Act, we went through the interim payment system, and during that period of time, CMS contracted with um, the University of Colorado, Peter Shaughnessy and Kathy Chrysler uh, were the two people that were instrumental in putting the OASIS together. The federal government felt that they weren't able to track progress and outcomes for patients, and so um, the quality initiative there was to get some fu uh, funding from the Robert Woods Foundation. And we contracted with the university to come up with um, a set of uh, items that would allow us to track quality and uh, allow us to track improvement for the patient. So from 2000, the year 2000 to the year 2014, we've had multiple versions of OASIS. We've had, um, we went from OASIS plain old OASIS to OASIS D1. Um, 2014 was the Impact Act, which kind of precipitated some of the activity that led up to OASIS E. Um, what the uh, Impact Act said is we needed to come up with a tool that we could use across all post-acute care um, settings. And so you'll see, if any of you have worked in with MDS, you'll see many um, areas of OASIS E that are very, very similar or exactly the very same as MDS. So the Impact Act is where we got that um, 
instruction um, and with uh, value-based purchasing, um, they will be able to track outcomes from different types of post-acute care settings and determine which one is the most beneficial for patients and most cost-effective for the federal government. So what is OASIS exactly? It's a document with a group of data elements um, this was developed by, by CMS. These data elements, however, are not a comprehensive assessment. And I find that, and I'm going to go over that a couple times in this session today, I find that often uh, clinicians and ad even administrators and owners believe that OASIS is the comprehensive assessment. It is not. And so we're going to get into that a little bit when we talk about the NOA and that type of thing. There are core items within the within a comprehensive assessment that are required uh, with an adult home care patient. So as we get into comprehension, the comprehensive assessment, I'm sorry, um, we will uh, discover that the data elements are separate from our narrative that we record in our hands-on assessment, the integration of that uh, comprehensive assessment into OASIS. The uh, data set is the, is the basis for measuring the patient outcomes and determining agency reimbursement. So much of what we do as far as the data collection um, is actually determining how much the agency will be paid and how much care the patient can actually get. So it's important that we study these guidelines very carefully and assure that these patients are getting everything they need as we're going through our assessments. So part of the comprehensive assessment use, is used to determine the patient's plan of care. And you'll see that as we go through this, um, this session today. So why OASIS? First of all, again, it determines reimbursement. So uh, depending on how we answer um, some of the data elements, um, we are um, eligible for a certain amount of payment for certain data items. It determines quality. So it measures the quality of home care using that, those data elements that we select for the agency. And it also um, helps us with health care planning overall. So it's used as a foundation for all of our home care patients and for our agencies in general. So there's some misconceptions about OASIS that um, we would like to dispel here. Um, first of all, uh, many agencies, and I talk to agencies almost daily, and um, many agencies still believe that OASIS has to be done at the start of care. Um, that is not so, particularly since we have the NOA, um, the submission, the notice of admission um, that is um, was a replacement for the RAP. And for those of us who have been involved in RAP submission for many years, uh, we found agencies would really try to speed up the, assess the total assessment process, in particular OASIS, and so that they could quote unquote drop the RAP and uh, paid um, the 50 or 60 percent of reimbursement that they would get in a uh, timely manner. Um, with the NOA, that's not required. The only thing that's required with the NOA is that we have a billable visit, that we have done an eligibility assessment on the patient, and that um, the patient, um, again, has a billable visit. And those billable visits can be found in uh, Chapter 7 of the OASIS Policy Manual, and I would encourage you to get those out and read them um, because there's many, many things. There's 15 items in particular that uh, clinicians can perform, uh, at least nursing can perform, uh, that would be considered a billable visit, and then you can um, submit your NOA. We have that five days. We uh, CMS has given us five days to complete an OASIS assessment, and that's very, very good for us, in particular going into value-based purchasing, because now we have an opportunity to have that time to get all of those disciplines into the home and assess the patient and determine what's the best plan of action for that patient with all team members involved. And so it wouldn't necessarily be just therapists and nurses, but also the family. Uh, we want to make sure that the family is very involved. Uh, we want to make sure that the home health aide is involved and the physician is involved. So that five days gives us an opportunity to do that. And I would encourage every agency to think about doing that. Um, again, many of your policies and procedures indicate a 48 hour 
um, assessment period, I would encourage you to expand that to um, give the clinicians an opportunity to get all of those assessments done because you're going to need that with value-based purchases. We're going to need that extra information and that team effort to make sure that we assess a patient appropriately and, and effectively and that we have excellent outcomes in the end when we discharge that patient. The um, assessment itself, the integrated assessment, uh, where you're doing your head to toe assessment, you're listening to, to their heart, you're listening to their lung sounds, that assessment should be very individualized. And um, the documentation of that assessment should be very individualized for each, each patient. Um, that is going to play a considerable role, not only in your survey, but if you are ever audited, um, that is something they look for very, uh, very carefully. Um, the questionnaire, um, the assessment uh, versus just questioning the patient, uh, make sure that your clinical staff understand that um, this OASIS collection is not an effort to ask the patient questions. It's not a game show. It is actually a time to assess the patient, have the input from the patient, the family, and all the other team players, but also um, as a result of your um, doing an adequate assessment. And this um, training manual that I mentioned earlier has excellent ideas on how to complete those assessment and gives you some tools to work with uh, when completing as opposed to asking a patient questions and using OASIS as a questionnaire. Um, the mini, uh, Impact Act and Meaningful Measure Priorities um, have to do with the two, that 2014 change that occurred. Um, and we are looking, with that, we're looking at communication with the patient. Uh, we're looking at coordination of care. Here we go again with that team effort and making sure that we have a really good assessment up front and also at the end. Um, we They feel that um, with the adequate assessment, we can uh, prevent chronic diseases with our teaching and that type of thing. Uh, we can work with communities uh, for best practices for healthy living. They want the patients to become more independent with their thinking about their health care. Uh, we want affordable care. Um, we've heard for years that Medicare is going to um, lo they're, they're losing money and they're not going to have money to sustain the program uh, for many, many years. And we, you know, we're going to see um, some of that uh, next year. They're already talking about a 7.8% 7 7 reduction in payment. Hopefully that won't happen, but um, they are seriously considering that. And then when value-based purchasing hits in 2015, we're really going to see the impact of um, how affordable the care that we're providing um, has been. We want safe care, so we want to make sure that our um, priorities as far as assessment and as far as care planning uh, provides for safe care with a reduction in harm, uh, making uh, the care safer by reducing the cost of care, and we can do that. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the use of technology and how we can uh, make care actually safer from uh, using technology. Um, strengthen partners in care with the patient and the family. We want to make sure that everybody is involved, and this is definitely a team effort. And then we will, um, part of this will be used to, in the treatment, the actual treatment of uh, chronic disease. And so this is some information here at the bottom about the amount of money that um, CMS is telling us they uh, spent in 2015. Um, up to $88.8 billion. Now we know 2020 was a really uh, bad year for all healthcare organizations, and there wasn't quite that much, I, I'm not sure exactly how much money was spent, but wasn't uh, quite the increase that they expected. Uh, but I believe the numbers are probably back to where they expected now. But the um, uh, increase in cost is one of the things that's precipitated some of the um, um, changes that we're seeing right now. Criteria used to develop OASIS E is um, the um, idea was to calculate a measure for the quality of, of the quality of care. So they used HHQRP to do that. Um, they use survey findings and um, they the survey process um, is designed around looking at OASIS and determining whether or not we are using critical thinking skills. 
um, in making that, doing that OASIS assessment and making it something that's usable for our care planning. The OASIS um, E was also um, put into place to contribute to the calculation of payment. And then um, it's a part of the calculation and home health compare. So your um, patients, family, patients and families, um, insurance companies, um, uh, Medicare itself are looking at home health compare. And so they're getting those numbers. You probably all know this. They're getting those numbers directly off of your OASIS data that you're submitting um, every so often to your states. And so you want to make sure that of the accuracy that and I've gone into a number of agencies and I've looked at OASIS assessments and found that oftentimes every single box is checked the very same way on almost all patients. Um, that's not the way we conduct OASIS. We have to conduct it with, again, using critical thinking skills, using assessment, having the patient get up and move, watch them move. Um, there's um, there's a number of strategies that needs to be used in getting an accurate OASIS assessment. So for OASIS E, we have some new things. We have determinants of health. So clinicians will cl collect and they're going to identify actionable items, which should be ultimately lead to better out care outcomes. Now, with determinants of health, I would encourage you to all start looking at some type of telehealth program and having uh, care available to that patient 24 hours a day. And it may not be hands-on care, but they would have someone to connect to, especially patients who um, are not getting out much at all and perhaps don't have family members or caregivers available to them. Um, this uh, determinants of health is going to collect uh, the information about transportation, about loneliness. There's going to be a number of things that we're going to um, be able to extrapolate from those determinants of health. There's a facilitation of transfer to other healthcare settings. So there's um, a lot of information in the new conditions, the new conditions are 2018, so they're a few years old now, but with the most recent conditions of participation about timeframes for transfer and health information to um, the um, institutional settings and to other settings like hospice and that type of thing. So you want to make sure that you have accurate information and that information is getting to um, the transferring entity in a timely fashion. Um, medications is one of the reasons for getting that information expedited. Many times when patients go into the emergency room or admitted to the hospital, even going to the doctor's office by themselves, they can't remember what medications they're on. So uh, our um, getting a reconciled uh, list of medications and determining whether the patient is on the right medications, um, that would be determined certainly by their primary physician, but getting that information is going to be really important. And if you think about it, home care is the only place you can get that because um, many of these patients hoard med medications. They pay a lot of money for them and they store them in drawers and cupboards and um, they'll bring them out only when the surveyor shows up. They don't necessarily show you when you're going out to do the start of care assessment, but it's interesting. So we have to do our very best um, to have them gather all those medications that they have have hidden um, in different places in their home and uh, show them to us when we go out to do our start of care assessment so that if the patient is discharged, we have a complete list and we can um, send that on to the um, transferring entity. So soon the transfer of health information will be added to the HQRP program. Uh, research shows that poor patient outcomes are directly related to medication issues. That's the number one reason patients go into the, back into the hospital is um, number uh, medication issues and not taking their medication, not being able to afford their medication. Oftentimes, um, the medication that they're taking uh, causes falls. Um, and so we have to um, make sure that they are taking the right medications so we can uh, we can avoid all of that. So let's talk about the instruction manual. Um, there is a new instruction manual, and I, I think that folks who have been in uh, home care for a long time are gonna be really excited about this manual. It's so organized, it gives us a lot of detail on what they expect us to be doing with the OASIS assessment itself. 
Um, there's item by item instruction. I know we had that in previous OASIS manual training manuals before, but this one gives us a lot more information um, so that we can train our staff um, to complete the assessment appropriately, efficiently, and effectively. The rationale and guidance necessary to accurately complete each um, item of the OASIS is included in there. There's some revisions uh, from the original um, that gives us um, more information about educational issues that we need to cover. Um, this is going to be aligned with many of the post-acute care settings. As I mentioned, the MDS um, is very similar to OASIS E. And so some of the instruction we get out of this new manual um, is very similar to what the MDS clinicians would be getting um, as far as completing their um, documentation. Uh, so there's new sections. Uh, some of them are added or renamed. Um, some of the items have been reorganized uh, within the section. Uh, some of the things you're going to have issues with, I believe, will be um, some of the cognitive and mood issue items. I, I have a hunch that it's going to take nurses and therapists a little bit longer to complete uh, that section of OASIS uh, when they get to it. Uh, the sections, again, have been alphabetized, um, and it begins with a brief introduction describing items found in the section. Um, the sources of information used to respond to items are now located in the first a bullet under response to specific instructions. Um, the OASIS D section that had the data resources in resources uh, has been taken out of OASIS E. There is dash language, so if you can't answer a question for whatever reason, um, they do have an opportunity in many of the items to use a dash indicating that you don't have enough information. I would be very, very careful uh, with the overuse of that um, and try to assure that you're getting as much information as possible. I always recommend you have a family member um, included in gathering OASIS assessment information. Um, as I mentioned earlier, some of these patients don't necessarily remember um, many things, and if they have a cognitive decline, um, they certainly aren't going to remember. So, um, that and that's the time typically when a patient can't remember or they don't want to answer that we use things like dashes to complete our assessment. Um, but CMS has is, um, warned us against using it. And um, I would highly recommend that you don't use it unless you absolutely have to. And I would also recommend that you have narrative indicating um, the reason uh, for using that dash item. Uh, the language has been added um, indicating that um, it's uh, you're not able to gather it, but it's not really a, an, ex, um, an acceptable response. So general formatting and organization changes have been made to improve in clarity and to re imp uh, remove redundancy, and it certainly has. Uh, this is uh, this is probably the best uh, manual that they have actually um, put out since OASIS started. Sections of the e-manual um, have uh, been presented in a standard format with ease of review by the, your staff. And so when you're doing your training, I think you're going to find it a lot easier to train your staff just because of the way it's laid out. They have different colors um, in the document. And um, I, I want to let you know that Access is actually um, taken the same manual and recreated. So we're going to have that available for you. It's a much shorter version, um, not shorter in words, but it's a shorter, um, the, the uh, information is more consolidated than it is on the um, manual that you can download. And you can download that um, free of charge as well. Uh, the access manual will also be free. But um, it'll be a little easier, I believe, for the um, clinicians to carry in their bags or uh, to use for training purposes. So there are coding tips in there. And just so that we are all on the same page, the coding they talk about in OASIS is not coding the ICD-10 coding. It's coding of the OASIS itself. So where um, the uh, documentation and what uh, number you're going to check or what letter you're going to um, give to that item 
is what they're talking about as far as coding instructions. So coding instructions and tips are included in the formatting in this new manual. OK, so this is the actual sections that you'll see in the training manual. Um, they're A through, they're alphabetical A through um, O, pretty much. Um, we have the GG items in here. Um, that So as a, an extra line for Gs, but um, pretty much alphabetical all the way through uh, to O. And um, you will find them, again, extremely easy to look at and to review in their in sections so that you could take each sec one section at a time to do your training and i think that'll be easier for your clinicians to digest and many of the clinicians by the way even if they told you they've been doing oasis for 20 years um it doesn't really matter because many many of the clinicians that are out there completing oasis have not been formally trained so this gives us an opportunity to get that formal training in and make sure that all of our clinicians are um, completing OASIS the very same way. So some guidance um, that we have um, for um, you uh, would be uh, the item display. Um, so the nonspecific guidance, uh, they start with a screenshot of the item that you're going to uh, be assessing. Uh, and then the guidance manual allows for the intent. So it tells you why they need to have that question answered. They don't tell you how to answer it, but they tell you why it needs to be answered. So um, again, um, as far as just general OASIS training recommendations, I definitely would um, encourage you to use the bottom to top um, instruction for your clinicians, making sure they start at the bottom of the questions and find a place that really fits that patient rather than starting at the top. Um, and you'll find that that uh, little hint will really help you improve your outcomes. It'll show the patient as sick or as functionally disabled as they are in the beginning. And then if you use that same strategy at the end at discharge, you're going to find you're going to get better outcomes. So the guidance manual also gives us a time point. So it'll tell us whether we're going to be doing this at the start of care discharge and at the other time points that are um, available to us. And it gives a rationale. So it explains why, um, why they're trying to get information from that particular item. And um, this is, I think this is um, a little more explanatory than we've had in the past. And I believe that all of us, if we um, want to do a really good job, it's easier if we know the why behind it. So having that rationale included in the training manual, I believe is really, really going to um, help clinicians understand the whole data set in general. So then it talks about the response. So the instructions on how to respond. And this is, again, a time that I want to remind you to start from the bottom of your scoring and work your way up. And then it gives us some coding instructions and tips. And again, this is an ICD-10 coding. This is um, OASIS coding. So um, an OASIS uh, choice of items that we want to score. So that is, the, in a nutshell, what you will find for every single OASIS item we have. All of these, I, all of these points are going to be identified on a page all by itself. And as I said, Access is coming out with a if, uh, tool um, that clinicians will probably be able to carry in their bag and have accessible to them at all times. It's just a little more consolidated than the one um, that's available online. So quality measures, there's some things that um, have uh, changed a little bit about the quality measures. So there's some more information about skin integrity and changes in skin integrity. Uh, medication reconciliation has really been expanded. Um, and so we're looking at high risk medications and that type of thing. But the medication reconciliation, don't try to do this by yourself. Make sure that you're talking to the, the doctor's office. Make sure you're talking to the pharmacy and getting as much information as you can so that you can reconcile these medications. Um, there's an area for incidence of major falls. Um, we've had um, in the past, we've had uh, collection of information about falls in general, but now they're looking at um, falls that um, actually cause patients problems. And then uh, again, as I mentioned before, the medications is the number one reason patients go back in the hospital. 
many times falls occur and that's the cause, but it's because of the medications not being taken properly. Transfer of health information again is um, going to be a target area and I'm sure you're going to see that for um, survey as well. They'll be looking more closely at uh, the transfer of information than they have in the past. And then your functional status, cognitive function, um, those areas in the manual, that's in section C, um, are going to take you time to train your staff. Um, and they're also going to take time for staff to complete. In particular, in the beginning of Oasis E, I think it's going to probably take add another 20 minutes to maybe 30 minutes to get it done appropriately. So some of the differences we have um, is a result of SPADES, the standardized um, patient assessment data elements. Um, we're going to have a BIMS assessment. It's an interview um, that we will use for um, determining the mental status of the patients. And then again, we're going to have those so social determinants of health and health that uh, I would encourage you to take a look at using telehealth in your operations so that you can um, get measurable determinants of health. I think that it's going to help you um, and it's actually going to help the patient as well. And they'll um, be able to you know, report issues regarding having medications available for the weekends. They'll be able to report whether or not they need dressings or they need dressing changes, whether they're going to need a PRN visit on, on the weekend or something like that. So those social determinants of health are going to be um, becoming um, more prominent as far as what CMS is looking at and also surveyors. So um, the care is directed at the patient, family, and community and it's more than just physical care. It's like caring for the whole patient. And um, with quadruple aim in um, the guidelines, uh, one of the areas that they talk about in quadruple aim is the inclusion of uh, everybody on the team as far as caring for the patient and teaching the patient. And CMS feels that if a patient takes more responsibility in their care, they'll stay healthier. Uh, so uh, it's up to us to make sure that we do the teaching that we need to do, gather the data in the, be the beginning to make sure that we know what to teach and then make sure that teaching gets done so we have positive outcomes. So some of the tips that we have is um, trying to make sure that you have goals always to improve the patient status and be careful about overdoing your goals. Make sure that your goals are specific and individualized to the patients. This is going to keep your patient out of the emergency room and out of the hospital. Um, make sure you establish reachable goals for your patients. Don't discharge too soon. I've been seeing uh, patients being discharged within 30 days. Um, AARP recently did a study um, on this and they're actually complaining to CMS about um, how few uh, visits were, are being done now since PDGM, and the patients are being discharged earlier than they had been before. So make sure that you're discharging at a time where the patient's ready to be discharged and you can sh show positive outcomes. Now, some of the patients may not go past 30 days, but um, according to some of the studies that have been done, there's a high percentage of patients that are being discharged prior to that 30-day billing period or at the 30-day billing period. Accurate OASIS is a must. Um, you want to make sure that you're accurate, so your acuity um, in uh, addressing each OASIS item is going to be important. Uh, make sure your documentation is consistent. You're telling the story all from the beginning to the end, and everybody is working toward that same goal. Um, service coordination is a must. Coordination of services is one of those things that I just don't think home care has ever really gotten right. And I think we need every tool in our toolbox to be able to say to um, CMS that yes, we finally get it and we are gonna be able to coordinate care and the coordination is done accurately, efficiently and effectively uh, for better outcomes for the patient. And then overall, we're going to improve the quality of care for the patient and that's uh, what's important for us now. So on our web, on the Access website, you'll see an Oasis E crosswalk that'll give you information about the differences between Oasis D1 and, D, and Oasis E. So you can download that. Again, it's a, it's a tool that's free of charge for you. And I certainly would um, encourage each clinician to have a copy of this. 
Um, and then this is the Oasis a sample of the Oasis E uh, chips um, in this what we I've just gone over with you, but it's that uh, tool, the manual, the guidance manual that CMS has um, put together. Um, it just reformatted in a different, a little bit different style. All the information is exactly the same, but it's just consolidated and easier for uh, for use for not only you, but also your staff. So um, again, in summary, Oasis E is the evolution of the Impact Act. We'll see more as we go forward. I'm sure we'll see an E1 coming up soon. Uh, this is going to be important that you get your training done probably starting next month because in September uh, because the it's going to take a while uh, for you to train everyone as I mentioned many of the clinicians that are out there seeing patients now have never had a formal OASIS training so this is an opportunity for you to use the change to OASIS E uh, for a formal training so then be aware of that OASIS totally impacts your revenue, it impacts your star ratings, and then that's certainly an evidence of your quality of care. Insurance companies are looking at these star ratings, so oftentimes insurance companies will discontinue contracts with staff, with uh, agencies if their ratings drop below four, uh, and I've seen that happen often. So you want to make sure your star ratings show up, uh, stay stay elevated we want to get as close to five as we possibly can and uh, we want to be consistent with that uh, value-based purchasing is going to kind of force that and unfortunately we're not going to know the results of value-based purchasing for each individual agency until 2025 but um right now we need to focus on making sure that we get an oasis e and get the data collected uh, properly um, again, there's multiple additions and deletions um, in the OASIS E document, but training for your staff, I can't stress that um, enough. I think that um, you all need to make sure that uh, training is done um, in a manner that is effective for your staff, but make sure it's done before the first of the year. We're going to have a lot to um, be working on come January 1, and that's when OASIS, actually, OASIS E, I'm sorry, actually begins. So value-based purchasing data and um, the OASIS E will begin on January 1st. So um, thank you so much for listening to the presentation today, and you can certainly um, check with anyone at Access if you have questions about this. We'll have ongoing training for each of the OASIS items uh, in the future and you'll be able to watch those free of charge on the Access website. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you for joining our on-demand training today. Access is the only home health care technology company approved by the American Nurses Credentialing Center to offer continuing education credits and the most recommended home health software on software advice. You can watch more on-demand training videos through our industry-leading help center or at access.com where you'll find tutorials, blogs, white papers, and answers to frequently asked questions. Access. Empowering care anytime, anywhere.